while we've got the opportunity. Good morning and welcome to the service of worship here at First Presbyterian Church. It's good to have you here uh, with us in the sanctuary. Uh, it is good to be joined by those of you who are watching via Zoom and those of you who are watching us uh, on the recording on our YouTube channel. You're welcome as well. It's good to have you here. Um, this is Independence Day weekend in the United States, and uh, we will make mention of that during the, the children's sermon. Um, we certainly uh, hope that uh, you all are taking the opportunity to use our prayer and preparation to prepare your heart and mind for the worship of God. Let's listen to our prelude and let us begin our worship time together. Good morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us, Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let, Let us worship God. God. Please stand as you are able and sing hymn number 490, Wash, O God, Your Sons and Daughters. When we walk from the darkness into the light, we can see ourselves as we really are. We see the spots of sin more clearly and realize that we need God's healing and redemption. Come confess your sins to God and wade into the river of the healer's mercy. Let us pray. God, you have caught us in our sinful behavior. 
We walk with our heads held high without noticing others and their burdens. We are blinded even to our own. We come to you with the hope of your restoration. Fill us with your peace and your mercy. Free us from the destruction of sin and restore us to a life lived in you. Amen. Peace is what you receive from God when you know that your sins are forgiven. In Jesus, we have received forgiveness and we have been restored. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. You may be seated. All right. You coming on down? Excellent. Let's see. Um, all right. Is this going to work? Maybe? Anyway. Ah, yes. Brilliant. I'm going to stand back a little bit because I don't have a mask on and you do. So just good. Um, so, it's 4th of July weekend, isn't it? So, wh what, what, does that, what does that mean? What does the 4th of July mean, do you think? There's, there's going to be fireworks, and we're going to celebrate, which is great, but what are we celebrating? I, okay, there you go. That's why I'm here. Uh, it, it's it's kind of like the birthday of the country, right? Um, on July 4th, 1776, a paper got signed, the Declaration of Independence, and we said, we're a free country now. And, and uh, that's what's coming up we, when we're celebrating that. One of the things that we're also celebrating, because we're here in church, is that we get to worship like we want to worship. So in other words, you don't have to be here at the Presbyterian Church. If you wanted to, you could go to the Methodist Church or the First Christian Church or the Unitarian Fellowship or, or the, the mosque. I mean, there's, there's lots of different places you could go, and you're free to do that. Not everybody lives in countries where that, that happens. Some people are not wor allowed to worship God at all, and some people are told exactly what kind of church they're going to go to to worship. So we're celebrating all kind of freedoms that we have, but especially because we're here in church, the freedom to worship. So uh, when you're watching all the fireworks go off, boom, 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 I hope you'll remember, I'm going to try to remember too, that we're celebrating our freedom to worship God like we want to worship God. All right? So have a happy 4th of July. Go ahead. Your word... O oh Lord, is our inspiration, our light, and our motion. Your word, O oh Lord, is power, is wisdom, is comfort. Guide us today as we listen to the word read and proclaimed. Fill us with understanding and the desire to change. Speak, Lord, your people listen. Amen. Amen. For the New Testament reading today, we're in um, the book of Luke, chapters 10 verses 1 through 11 and verses 16 through 20. I think that's page 21 
in the New Testament in your Bibles on the back. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, and no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and all over the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You may be wondering, why isn't there a ministry of music? And that's because we're taking a July hiatus for the ministry of music. So, the whole month. The whole month. That'll be back in August. Our Old Testament, Old Testament passage this morning comes from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 5. And I believe your, your uh, bulletin says verses 1 through 12, but I'm going to do 1 through 14. And it's on page 336, I believe, of your Old Testament, so please read along. My friends, here... The good news, the word of God. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man in high, and in high favor with his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans, Arameans on one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, that's the king by the way, just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, go then, I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me 
that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away saying, I thought that he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, far better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you have not done it? How much more when all he said to you was, wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. The word of the Lord. Counterintuitive. That's a phrase or a word we've heard analysts choose on the news a lot over the last few years. It basically means that we expect something will go one way, but it turns out another. For instance, there's an old Bloom County comic, a uh, comic strip that takes place in a, in a bar. So yeah, I'm going to tell a joke, right? Two people go into a bar. We see two guys, a dock worker, muscle-bound, shaved head, anchor tattoo. In other words, a rough and tough blue-collar laborer. The other guy is a bearded, long-haired hippie. And obviously they've been drinking. And the dock worker says, you know what I think? I think our country should be doing more to live up to its ideals, like providing everyone a quality education and access to good medical care. Everyone should have a safe place to sleep and enough food to eat. And I think we should take better care of the really young and the really old, too. Anyway, that's what I think. The hippie looks at him for a split second and then yells, Hey, America, love it or leave it, you commie pinko. <laughs> Counterintuitive. The bleeding heart liberal should be the hippie and vice versa. We can find all kinds of examples of this in our lives. To have expectations is the most natural thing in the world. We make observations and we have experiences that affect our lives and we reach certain conclusions about our world based upon them. If for years and years our spouse <clears throat> has ordered pancakes and sausage for breakfast, that it's certainly going to surprise us when he or she suddenly orders a vegetarian omelet with green tea. And one of the great lessons that Dr. Phil has shared with us is that past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. We intuitively believe this to be true. The challenge for us is not to equate our expectations with absolute truth. I'm going to say that again in case you've already zoned out. Come back to me. The challenge for us is not to equate our expectations with absolute truth. For time and time again, if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, Every single thing is more complex and unpredictable and surprising than how we expect it to be. Let's look at our passage from 2 Kings this morning as an example. The Bible takes the surprising position that God is using Naaman, a general in the enemy's army, to wipe out the current king and queen of Israel. You would expect that God loved the king and queen of Israel. After all, Israel is the land of God's chosen people. However, the kings following after the wicked king Ahab are just like Ahab. They are not big fans of God or God's ways. In fact, they prefer evil and they have turned away from God. 
So the beginning of our passage lets us know that if we have eyes to see it and ears to hear it, that God is using Naaman and the Aramean army to cast out evil. And that evil is found in the most unexpected place in Israel. And it's very unexpected to have an enemy of God's chosen people to be the instrument that God uses to straighten those people out. So see, counterintuitive and complicated, just like I said. The passage tells us that during one of his victories over the Israelites, Naaman had captured a young girl and given her to his wife to be a servant. The passage also says Naaman suffered from leprosy, a disease that eats away and kills the skin. The little girl knew about the prophet Elisha, who I'm sure you'll remember for a short time had been Elijah's apprentice. Remember when Elijah goes up in the chariot of fire? It's Elisha that's shouting at him, see you later, come back soon, kind of thing. The little girl suggests that Naaman's leprosy could be healed by the prophet Elisha. Obviously, the little girl didn't understand how impossible it would be for something like that to happen. How could a general from the enemy army ask a prophet of an unfamiliar god, who we call God, for help? The whole idea is absurd. But as they say, desperate times, like having leprosy, call for desperate measures. Soon, Naaman has talked to his boss, the king of Aram, who then in turn sends a letter requesting that the king of Israel cure Naaman of his affliction. A little while later, Elijah hears of this request. Elisha hears of this request and says, okay, send Naaman on over. God will grant this request. So far, nothing at all has gone according to expectations. And we're not done yet. Naaman is an important man and has become accustomed to be respected and treated in a way that befits his rank and his reputation. Do you know who I am? Comes to mind. So when he arrives at Elisha's home in Samaria, Naaman is expecting a respectful reception. But all that happens is Elisha sends out a messenger with a simple prescription. Go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored and you shall be clean. Now this makes Naaman mad. This makes Naaman mad. He wants the full religious ritual and the ceremony. He wanted Elisha to come out in robes and headdress and to dance and to chant and to call on God's name. Maybe even throw in, throw in a burnt offering just to be sure. He wanted the full show. But none of that happens. Just go and wash in the river. That's it. Since Naaman's expectations went so unmet, he was unwilling to do what the prophet had told him. I'm not going down to that dirty old Jordan River. We have much better rivers back in my hometown of Damascus. Today we might say something like, go home and get some rest. That's crazy talk. I want a real doctor, the kind that gives me lots of medications. But fortunately for Naaman, or should I say providentially for Naaman, again, there are some servants there who give him wise counsel. Essentially, they say, hey, Elisha's made this easy for you. Why not give it a try? And so he does. He immerses himself seven times in the Jordan River, and suddenly his skin is healed and clean. Now, don't you think this is the most unexpected thing of all? It actually works. I come from a river town, and never once did my doctor tell me to treat my chicken pox or my poison ivy by going and splashing for a while in the Mississippi River. But Naaman is cured, completely contrary to anyone's expectations except for the little servant girl and Elisha. 
a foreigner and a worshiper of foreign gods is healed and made clean. I believe that we are always in need of learning and relearning that God can do whatever God wants to do. All of us are guilty of thinking and teaching that God must do such and such a thing or act in such and such a way. And believe me, it's so easy to see when someone else does it. It's much harder to acknowledge that you and I do the same thing. The box that you keep God in may not be the same box that I keep God in, but few of us are willing to accept the idea that God is wild and free and on the loose and is not bound by what you and I expect God to do. Another challenging lesson from our passage today is that we sometimes get called to minister to people who have no other reason. We get called to minister to people for no other reason than they need our ministry. Again, let, let just let that soak in for a second. We get called to minister to people for no other reason than they need our ministry. Naaman was not going to give anything back to Elisha or his people. In fact, there's a pretty good chance that Naaman would be leading the Aramean troops against the Israelites sometime in the foreseeable future. Just one more time for emphasis. Naaman was a general in the enemy army. But God worked through Elisha to bring healing to Naaman. And when that healing was given, there wasn't a demand that Naaman give his life over to God first. There wasn't a checklist of beliefs he had to, pr to prescribe to first or subscribe to first. God graciously healed Naaman through Elisha, and that was good enough for God. There are people in this community of ours who need our care and our compassion, and we cannot expect them to give anything back. We give even if they may never come to church. We help knowing that they may never remember us with a donation. They may never even say thank you or show the slightest bit of appreciation, and that needs to be okay going in. God calls us to love our neighbor. End of sentence, end of, of ex expectations. But the fact is that Naaman did come to believe in God. That's later on in the story. Elisha's act of healing and love was enough to bring Naaman to salvation, to know and to love God. Maybe sometimes when God acts through our loving outreach and mission, it will have the same effect. We can hope for that, but we can't expect that. It's counterintuitive, isn't it, to give to those who may not value the same things we do. It's counterintuitive to really believe that God will act beyond and above our expectations. Sometimes it's counterintuitive to recognize that God is actually speaking to you and me through these Bible stories from more than 3,000 years ago. But here's the good news. Sometimes those things that we don't know and don't even know that we don't know will help us in amazing and unexpected ways. Amen. Please stand as you are able and turn to, in your hymnal, to page 17 as we confess our faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. 
He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And if you would turn in your hymnal to number 338, O Beautiful for Specious Skies. You may be seated. I am briefly going to share with you the minute for mission today. Um, going to give you sort of a headline news version of what's going on at the General Assembly. The Presbyterian Church USA is in the middle of their General Assembly. It's a different format this year. It is three weeks long. Um, it's hybrid style. So some commissioners and uh, officials and everything are in Louisville, which is where the headquarters of the church is, and uh, other folks are joining via Zoom or whatever electronic technology that they're using. So uh, it's, it, it's spanning over three weeks, and, and there is a lot going on. Um, like I said, this is going to be headline kind of stuff, and that's for two reasons. One, I don't want to lay you down, you know, burden you down with detail. Uh, that you probably aren't all that interested in. Secondly, I have not been following it all that closely, so I don't know all the details myself. So if there's something here that really interests you, we can research it together and find out more about that. But I'm, I'm giving you the headlines. Um, one of the things that has been true during the time of my ministry, and I don't know whether it's true for you, Judy, or not, but it always seems like there's someone, some entity at the General Assembly that's restructuring that has been a thing for the last 50 years. They just keep restructuring, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to make too much light of that. Uh, it's because we have changing conditions. The denomination continue, continues to decline in membership, and the finances are, are not there, and they keep thinking of there may be new ways to be more effective. The Presbyterian Mission Agency, if you think of the, if you think of the, 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 uh, the, the headquarters, the, the main office of the, of the church in two big sections, the Office of General Assembly and the Presbyterian Missions Agency, this is one of those. Presbyterian Missions Agency is thinking about a, a major restructuring and this restructuring would give pr primary, new primary emphasis to the Matthew 25 initiative, which I'll bet many of you have heard of, the Matthew 25 initiative. Let me give you, again, just sort of the headlines there. The Matthew, Matthew 25 initiative is a denomination-wide movement initiative with the idea of focusing on building 
congregational vitality, so redeveloping and revitalizing congregations, that's one. Secondly, dismantling structural racism, so that would be within the country, but also within the church. And then three, eradicating systematic poverty. So that's, those are the emphasis. They're great big things. But in order to, to move in that direction, certain things that have been emphasized will no longer be emphasized, if you understand what I, what I mean. There are limited amount of resources, limited amount of people. If we're going to go in this direction, um, and this is, again, just a possibility that has not been voted on yet. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing that has been talked about is should the four special offerings be reconfigured? Again, to better reflect new realities, new challenges of being church in 2022. Uh, there is some continuity in the leadership. Uh, Dr. Diane um, Given Moffitt is going to remain as the, the president and the director of the Presbyterian Mission um, uh, Agency. Uh, and the stated clerk has five associate stated clerks, and they've all been reelected. So as we go through this time of transition, there is some continuity in leadership, which is good. Um, uh, the General Assembly will be talking about whether to adopt a thing called the 2020 Vision Teams uh, call. Uh, for the church to be, okay, catch this, prayerful, courageous, united, serving, and alive. Let me say that again. Prayerful, courageous, united, serving, and alive. So you've caught it, right? P-C-U-S-A. All right. How are you going to argue with that? No, we shouldn't be prayerful or courageous. There, there, there is an alphabet soup of committees that, that make up the church. Uh, one of those uh, committees is the International Engagement Committee. You can only imagine how um, deep and, 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 and uh, uh, thorny the, uh, the conversation there has been. They've been talking about issues such as Israel and Palestine, which, again, since the beginning of the church, they've been talking about that stuff. Um, use of sanctions humanitarian efforts in sub-Saharan Africa, the Russia-Ukrainian uh, war, and, and more. So they're in the middle of, of those wrestlings. Uh, Ecumenical and Interfaith Committee is hoping to approve, this is such great church language, to, to approve the development of a template for inter-church partnerships, which would be called Global Covenant Agreements. And again, I don't know all the details about that, but I think the whole idea is that we expand who we're relating to and who we're interacting with. I know there is more conversation about, like right now, if you didn't have a PCUSA minister, uh, by agreement you could probably have a United Church of Christ minister or a minister from the uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, right? Those are the churches that we're in full communion with. There's talk about expanding that to include more churches if other churches are interested as well. Uh, immigration Committee, um, PCUSA should become a sanctuary and accompanied church, accompanist church, accompaniment church, um, which you might say, well, yeah, duh. Uh, I think the whole idea is that we declare this as a, na as a denomination and not just leave it to individual congregations to make that decision. Uh, and then the last thing that I wrote down is that um, within the General Assembly, there are these series of advo advocacy committees. The whole idea is to don't, don't lose sight of whatever the issue is. Don't you know, Be sure to pay attention to. And uh, they are talking about the formation of a new advocacy committee for the General Assembly, an LGBTQIA plus equity advocacy committee within within the structure so that's that's what I know there's much more like I said it's three weeks and 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 uh, these committees uh, debate this stuff in great depth there are motions and counter motions and you know the 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 uh, the parliamentary procedure just flies everywhere um, and, and and then after that the the assembly gets together and talks about these things again as a whole and, and, and finally, uh, with God's leadership, there is some discernment about what comes next. And when that happens, I'll give you an update uh, on, on this. We're still in process. We're still in the middle of all this. So 
like I said, if you have any questions, I can tell you where you can do the research, or I, I'll be happy to do the research with you. All right, I'm ready to move on, whatever that might entail. On to offering, right? The inv invitation for the offering. God has given us healing, word, forgiveness. God has given us so much. Let us now take the time to respond in gratitude by giving what has been given to us. Gracious God, help us to use the gifts you have given us with mercy, love, and wisdom so that we can continue to honor the trust you have put in us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we begin our time of congregational prayer, pastoral prayer and congregational prayer, um, just a reminder that um, we, we have this practice now of filling out uh, prayer, prayer, concern, prayer 
cards and or joy cards and concern cards. Uh, you can sign those as you come into the um, sanctuary or the the Zoom greeter uh, asks you for those. Uh, for those of you who are on Zoom, um, I've got uh, uh, a joy to share from here in the sanctuary, and I will do that now. Uh, and that is that a successful Red Cross blood drive, joy, the joy is being felt for a success, this is from Lisa, um, uh, successful Red Cross blood drive, which was relocated at the last minute from uh, St. Francis to our fellowship hall. The folks at St. Francis had a funeral uh, that they needed to accommodate, so the blood drive people came over here. And thanks to walk-in donors from our congregation, the Red Cross met its collection goal. And they felt very well treated and very welcomed, and they were very appreciative. So that, that is a great joy indeed. Um, are there any uh, joys from the folks in Zoom? Yes, we do. Can you hear me? <laughs> OK. Yeah, well, I can. <laughs> Yay. OK. Um, Bob and Elena would like to give thanks to everyone who checked in with them as they continue recovery from some health issues. All right. Anything else? Nope, not for okay. joy. That's, that's awesome. We give thanks to God for these blessings. Under concerns, um, I again have a note here. Last week, Lisa tested positive for COVID. Uh, after traveling with an asymptomatic co-worker, she is grateful for very mild symptoms and that Roe has tested negative. Lily, have you got uh, some, um, some concerns? Um, I do. Um, we would like prayers for Dee Dee. And it's also a joy because Dee Dee has a follow-up diagnostic MRI on July 5th. And she's hoping to get uh, more information and good news. Uh, also, uh, Bob and Elena um, would like prayers for their friend, Carl, who's been waiting a month for hip replacement um, due to some instability in his uh, blood sugar levels. And that's it for us. All right, thank you. For all these people and all who are in need, God inspires us to pray, hears our prayers, and answers our prayers. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, we thank you for the blessings that you offer us, including this country in which we live and for the freedoms that uh, we enjoy. We are not always pleased with how we live together as a country and how decisions get made and um, how we interact with one another. But um, we thank you for the, the desire that you instill in us that we continue to live out this, this charter, this, this constitution, this desire to be the best nation that we can be. So again, we express our thanks and we ask for the commitment and the courage to be the best citizens that we can be. In the same way, Lord, we thank, we thank you for the blessings that you continue to bestow upon us and we ask that you will help us to follow you as closely as we can to, to see you more clearly each day and to love you and to follow you. We ask, Lord, that you will help us to minister to one another, but not just to one another, but to all who we see and know need our care and our ministry, and not that we would do it for our own benefit, but for theirs and to your glory. We take this time now to still our lips and to open our hearts wide open and offer up the prayers of the people.
Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 340. This is my song. If you're comfortably able, please stand and let's sing. Y'all are more than welcome to go and fellowship with one another in the fellowship hall. Just keep a social distance and keep your masks on. Uh, that would be, that'd be great and wonderful. And those of you on Zoom, you just keep fellowshipping because that's a great thing to do. You can do that on Zoom. Um, we will continue to monitor the COVID transmission rate. And if it drops below high again, the masks will go back to the optional status. That's just the world we live in uh, right now. So. Hear now our blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.